As we begin a new study in Revelation, we see in chapter 1 that the book of Revelation is all about the exalted Jesus and his revelation of his plan for the world and how the church must endure in times of persecution. So I invite you to join us today, and I hope that you'll be blessed. Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. He bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And then in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Allow me to go to the Lord before we begin. Father God, I pray that you would guide our time here today. I pray that we would take from your word what you would have us to, that this would not simply be information, but that it would be transformational. Guide us throughout this series, Lord. Help us to stay faithful to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to quote one character, what one character said to another in one of my favorite science fiction movies, The Matrix, I bet you feel a lot like Alice, don't you? Tumbling down the rabbit hole. Well, most of us are familiar with the fairy tale Alice in Wonderland. Even if you don't recall all the details, you probably remember that it's about a little girl named Alice who follows a white rabbit into a rabbit hole. And after emerging on the other side, she finds herself in the middle of a strange land filled with human-like animals, including a disappearing cat bizarre events, and characters with names like Mad Hatter. Well, since Lewis Carroll published Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in 1865, it's been a story that's captured the imaginations of both children and adults. But while it's certainly entertaining, many readers don't know what to make of it. Some have even seen it as an example of what's called the literary nonsense genre which is defined as a type of literature that, quote, balances elements that make sense with some that do not, with the effect of subverting language conventions or logical reasoning. 
The biblical book of Revelation tends to evoke the same sort of responses from its readers. Well, many Christians have read the book of Revelation and have maybe even been excited and awestruck by it. Comparatively few have walked away from it feeling as if they understood what they just read. Most Christians would never say it out loud, but they probably think that maybe the book of Revelation should go into the same category as a bizarre fairy tale, like Alice in Wonderland. Interesting, but at the end of the day, incomprehensible and therefore irrelevant. But on the other hand, there are those who see Revelation as a blow-by-blow schedule of the end times, which includes some complex codes that need to be cracked with the illumination of modern-day events. But what if Revelation is neither of those things? What if it's a very intentional work of literature from start to finish, just like the rest of the books of the Bible? And what if it's not so much a detailed program of the end times, but rather a message of hope for the church? I'm not going to pretend that Revelation is an easy book to understand. It's probably the most difficult book in the Bible. That's But as Pastor Alistair Begg has said regarding Revelation, the plain things are the main things, and the main things are the plain things. In other words, there's a lot in Revelation that's not straightforward and readily applicable. But the things that are plain are those that God has placed front and center. The book of Revelation is about the unveiling of the exalted Jesus and his plan for the world so that our trust and hope in him would be strengthened. And that's a paragraph that I'm going to repeat throughout this series. Even if we don't understand all of the strange images and symbols throughout the book, we'll be all right as long as we stick to the main point, as long as we keep the person and purposes of Jesus front and center. So what I want to do today in today's message is to answer four primary questions about the book of Revelation. Number one, what kind of writing is Revelation? Number two, how should we read Revelation? Number three, who is the focal point of Revelation? And number four, why was Revelation written? So number one, what kind of writing is Revelation? Well, probably more so than any other book of the Bible, knowing what kind of genre Revelation belongs to will help us to get off to a good start. Remember that a genre is a category of artistic composition. We're all familiar with the various genres of music. There's country and R&B and jazz and hip-hop. Or with the genres of movies, comedy, action, drama, sci-fi. And of course, the genres of literature, like poetry, short stories, memoirs, novels, essays. And when we come to the study of Scripture, there are very particular genres that we need to pay attention to if we're going to read the books of the Bible the way they were meant to be read. You don't sit down and start reading a poem as if it were a novel, and vice versa. No, you first identify what it is you're about to read, then you go to that work of literature with a certain set of expectations that help you to understand and appreciate what you're reading. The entire Bible is God's word, which means that God is its ultimate author. But God has allowed his word to be recorded by human authors who wrote what they received from him in the form of the accepted genres of their time. The book of Revelation is a combination of three biblical genres. If you're a note taker, you might want to take these down. We can actually see what those are within the first four verses. We'll look at these in reverse order. So starting with verse four. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. So right away, this clues us into the fact that Revelation is a letter that was to be sent to seven churches. Ancient letters were written with standard openings and closings, much like the letters of Paul. So this one's no different. We find our next genre indicator in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Prophecy. 
So John is letting us know that much of the content of this letter to the churches is going to be within the genre of prophecy. Now we have to be careful here because much of the time when we hear the word prophecy, our minds immediately go to the image of a person predicting future events in a sort of Nostradamus type way. And while that is a large part of what biblical prophecy is, we need to remember that prophecy is not just predictions about the future, but also God's mediator saying, thus saith the Lord. Just like his Old Testament predecessors, John, throughout Revelation, exhorts his readers to be obedient. He warns the disobedient of coming judgment and reminds everyone about the character of God. That's the standard fare of the prophets. So we see the third indicator of Revelation's genre in the first line of the very first verse. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, the English word revelation is a translation of the Greek word apokalypsis, from which we get our word apocalypse. When we hear the word apocalypse or apocalyptic in our context, it's often associated with the end of the world or the events of the end time. But the basic meaning of the word apocalypse is an unveiling or a disclosure of something. In the Bible, it's often used to describe a mystery that had once been hidden but is now being revealed. So verse 1 could just as easily read the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Some translations simply maintain the word apocalypse, and they titled the book The Apocalypse of John. So Revelation can be classified under the category of apocalyptic. Bible scholars Scott Duvall and Daniel Hayes define the genre of apocalyptic as, quote, a group of writings that include a divine revelation, usually through a heavenly intermediary, to some well-known figure in which God promises to intervene in human history and overthrow evil empires and establish his kingdom. Most scholars believe that apocalyptic grew out of Hebrew prophecy and actually represents an intensified form of prophecy written during a time of crisis. So putting all of that together, the book of Revelation is a prophetic apocalyptic letter, which tells us right away that this is a very unique book within its own context. Yet it's also one that we can approach with certain expectations. Who is the author of this apocalyptic letter? Well, we've already seen that it's a man named John. And this is traditionally understood to be the John, the beloved disciple John. The same John that wrote the fourth gospel. Now, there are some modern scholars who dispute that, but I can say for myself that after spending lots of time studying the gospel of John for the previous series, and now spending lots of time studying Revelation, it seems very apparent that both books have the same author. The genre of Revelation is obviously much different from John's gospel. But as you read, you'll pick up on various words and phrases that the Apostle John likes to use. And you'll see his overall themes are much the same in both books. So just just as Luke penned both his gospel, then afterward the book of Acts, we can reasonably believe that John penned his gospel, then afterward, perhaps as a much older man, he penned Revelation. So one of the things that will help us the most as we approach Revelation is knowing the context within which its writing took place. Just like every other book of the New Testament, Revelation was written in the first century anywhere from 30 to 60 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. That means that by the time of its writing, the Christian church had become firmly established in the Mediterranean world, and perhaps even further out than that. But while the church was rapidly expanding, the persecution of the church was becoming more and more of an issue. Christians were first persecuted by the Jews, but as time went on, they would be in the crosshairs of the Roman Empire. By that time in history, Rome was forcing all of its subjects, which included Christians, to pledge allegiance to the emperor and even worship him as a god. 
The Roman authorities actually created images of the emperor that people would be forced to bow down in front of. Therefore, many believers were forced to make the tough decision of whether to bow the knee to Caesar and effectively engage in idol worship, or to refuse and risk imprisonment or exile or even death. So it's for this reason that John seems to have been exiled to the small island of Patmos, about 40 miles southwest of Ephesus. In verse 9, he writes, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The tribulation that John mentions is surely a reference to the persecutions that were beginning to ramp up within the Roman Empire. Evidently, John had been doing the work of the Great Commission, preaching the gospel, making disciples, and as a result of that, found himself in trouble with the Roman authorities, who sentenced sentenced him to live the rest of his days in exile, where he could no longer cause any trouble. But the Romans could not have known that being exiled on that island would give occasion for an amazing revelation from God that John would write down and that would eventually become the last book of the Bible. In verse 10, John describes how this came about. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. In that part of the world during that time, some people celebrated what they called Emperor's Day in which the Roman emperor was given special attention once a month. But of course, Christians had their own day that wasn't celebrated monthly, but weekly. They called it the Lord's Day. Now, we shouldn't confuse the Lord's Day with the Jewish Sabbath. The Sabbath is on Saturday, but the Lord's Day is on Sunday, the day in which Jesus rose from the grave. And that's why, to this day, Christians most often gather to worship on Sunday. So all of that to say that John was apparently engaged in his own time of worship on the Lord's day when he suddenly hears a voice from heaven, which says, starting in verse 11, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, first of all, we need to note that John is told to write what he sees, We're told at the beginning of this book that what follows is going to be mostly composed of a series of visions that John receives from God. So this is another indicator that what we're going to read in this book is not simply a straightforward letter, like reading Paul's letter to the Ephesians, but rather a work that's full of images and symbols that may not be immediately understandable. Yet at the same time, it is meant to be a letter that is sent to a group of seven churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. If you were to look at a map of Asia Minor and locate each of these cities, you would see that the order in which they're listed here is the same order that this letter would likely be circulated. So after completing it, John would have it sent to Ephesus. And after the Ephesians read it in their worship gathering, they would send it off to Smyrna. And on and on it would go until every major region had a chance to read it. Now this tells us that this wasn't just a private vision that was only meant for John. But it was given, first of all, for the sake of the churches of the first century in Asia Minor. Then to every church in every age. So to sum up what the book of Revelation is, it is a prophetic, apocalyptic letter written by John the Apostle to seven first-century churches, as well as to the universal church. Now, we come to our second question, how should we read Revelation? First of all, it should go without saying that we ought to read Revelation prayerfully and with much humility. If we simply rush into reading Revelation with our own preconceived ideas about what the book is supposed to be saying, or with concepts that we've picked up from end times books or movies, then we're probably going to be starting off on the wrong foot. We should start out by praying to God for the eyes to see what's really in this book, 
as well as a humble heart and an open mind to receive it from it things that might unsettle us or even explode preconceived ideas. As I preached about last week, if we approach this book with a spirit of humility, then we are not going to, to divide over tertiary issues of eschatology. Remember, eschatology is in time study. We should hold to the details of Revelation rather loosely while grasping firmly the main things and the plain things that ought to unite us. And of course, we need to do that because there's a lot in Revelation that's not straightforward. As church history has shown, it can be interpreted in almost an unlimited number of ways. And as I've already noted, that's in large part because of the genre or style in which Revelation is written. With the exception of the letters to the seven churches, the predominant content of Revelation is composed of symbolic imagery, most of which is not easy to interpret. That means that we should indeed seek to interpret Revelation as faithfully as possible, but not as literalistically as possible. To try to press everything you read in Revelation into a literal mode is going to miss the point of what this book is doing. So, for instance, in verse 16, Jesus is pictured as having a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Now, I do not think we're supposed to take that literally. The exalted Jesus doesn't have an actual sword perpetually coming out of his mouth. Rather, this is a symbolic description of God's word proceeding from the mouth of Jesus. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We should interpret the symbols according to how they're interpreted in other parts of Scripture whenever possible. And if they're not interpreted for us in other parts of Scripture, we need to look at the context in which they're found within Revelation to determine what part they play in the overall narrative. We create problems for ourselves when we try to press the imagery that we find in Revelation too literalistically. And we can tend to come up with wacky interpretations like the locusts being Apache helicopters. So instead of approaching Revelation in an overly literal way, we should think of it as an experience akin to walking through an art gallery. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright notes that what John is saying is impressionistic. It appeals not to logic, but to the imagination. The dictionary defines impressionism as a literary or artistic style that seeks to capture a feeling or experience rather than to achieve accurate depiction. Now, all of this is to say that what we read in Revelation is not to say that what we read in Revelation is not trustworthy. Revelation is a part of the Bible, which means that we should read it and cling to it as a part of God's trustworthy word. We shouldn't assume that just because the book is filled with symbolic imagery that it can be treated with less seriousness than other books. That would be like saying that Jesus' parables weren't really all that important because they weren't depictions of literal events. No, they were a method of communicating truths that were of the utmost importance. So instead, we should read Revelation and its symbols as pointing to deep truths about God and his plans for the world that we all need to take to heart. Traditionally, there have been four main ways to interpret the book of Revelation. And if you have one of those handouts, it might help to glance at that as I go through this. There's futurism, historicism, preterism, and idealism. And I'll briefly explain each one of those. Starting with futurism. So futurism is what it sounds like. It holds that the events of Revelation primarily take place in the future, typically in the time period just before Jesus' return. Therefore, the book is composed of yet-to-be-fulfilled prophecies. And this is the most popular way of reading Revelation and the approach that probably all of us are most familiar with. Next is historicism. Historicism views the events of Revelation as unfolding over the course of church history. 
So instead of viewing events as being completely in the future, such interpreters believe that some events have already been fulfilled, while others still await fulfillment. Now, this is a view that was much more in use during the Reformation era, in which a lot of the Protestant reformers would interpret things like the beast or the Antichrist as being the Pope, or as Babylon as being the Roman Church. But nowadays, not many people would claim to hold to the historicist view. The next view is preterism. Preterism understands the events of Revelation in large part to have been fulfilled in the first century of the Christian era. So most such interpreters would say that much of the book was fulfilled with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Remember that the Romans sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. So most of the book is in the past tense, according to them. Now, we do need to make a distinction here between full preterism and partial preterism. Full preterism does not fall within the bounds of Orthodox Christianity because such interpreters believe that all of the events in Revelation have already been fulfilled, including the return of Christ. Now, I think that most of us realize that Jesus has not yet visibly returned. Therefore, we should take full preterism off the table. But there are several evangelical Christians who are partial preterists. The late R.C. Sproul was one of them. So that, that is a valid option when it comes to interpreting Revelation. Lastly, we have the interpretive approach of idealism. Idealism understands Revelation to set forth timeless truths concerning the battle between good and evil that continues throughout the church age. So while each of the preceding views have to do with the question, when are these events fulfilled? Idealism instead asks, what do these timeless symbols mean for our day and age? Now, while there are those who hold to just one of those particular views rigidly, we should not think that those interpretive approaches are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can be a futurist with some elements of idealism or an idealist with some elements of preterism. These are meant to be helpful grids with which to read, not constraining systems that would impose anything on the text. And that's why I would opt for a hybrid or an integrated approach, using elements of futurism and preterism and idealism. And my one exception is I don't think historicism is very helpful, at least not the way that the reformers used it. So now we'll move on to the third main question, and that is, who is the focal point of Revelation? Well, the focal point of Revelation from start to finish is Christ Jesus. The opening line of chapter 1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which gave him, which God gave him to show to his servants. Now that can be taken in more than one way. We can take this as being a revelation or unveiling of Jesus, of who Jesus is, his character, and his works. Or we could read it as being a revelation that comes from Jesus. Now, in a certain sense, the book of Revelation comes from each member of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Most commentators believe that the Holy Spirit is most likely what's being referred to in verse 4, where it says, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Throughout the Bible, the number seven symbolizes perfection or completion. So this may simply be a way of saying that the fullness of God surrounds his throne. It's not saying that the Holy Spirit is divided into seven. But as we see when we keep reading, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, becomes the main focus. So just as with the rest of Scripture, everything we read in this book should, in one way or another, lead us back to Jesus. We learned a lot about Jesus when we worked our way through the Gospel of John. But in this book, we get to see a different side of Jesus that we don't get to see in the Gospels. And what we read about him here in the first chapter is a good indicator of that. 
instead of the mostly meek and mild Jesus that we meet in the Gospels, here we get to see Jesus in the fullness of his glory. Not only truly man, but truly God. In systematic theology, the character and work of Jesus has traditionally been described in terms of his threefold office as prophet, priest, and king. And we can see Jesus fulfilling each one of these offices right here in chapter 1. Throughout this chapter, we can see Jesus as a prophet, proclaiming the words of God and speaking to the people of God, in this case through an intermediary. We can also see him in his role as priest. Starting in verse 12, we read, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The clothing that's described here is the clothing of a high priest. The high priest of Israel would wear a long robe with a sash. And when he wore those garments, he would make sacrifices for the sins of the people. But Jesus is showing himself to be the ultimate high priest the one who atoned for the sins of those who would trust in him by his own blood. And we see that in, the, in part of verse 5. So Jesus is revealed here in the opening chapter as the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest, and especially as the ultimate king. Backing up to verse 5, we read, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, it's a reference to his resurrection, and the ruler of the kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So we see here that Jesus is not only a king, but he is the king of kings. Even now he rules over the kings and presidents and prime ministers of the earth. And through his sacrificial blood, he has made us, his church, into a kingdom of priests. We are God's representatives of reconciliation to the rest of the world. We are ambassadors of a powerful and just and merciful king. And we who trust in Jesus even now are members of a kingdom without end. But Revelation goes even further in its description of Jesus. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. This means that Jesus encompasses all things. There's nothing outside of his control or sovereignty. And as the second part of that verse says, he always has been and always will be. He is eternal because he is God. And this sounds a lot like the description of Jesus that Paul gives us in Colossians 1. Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." Now, it's scripture passages that, like that that cause us to stop in our tracks and marvel at how glorious and awesome Jesus is. Jesus is infinitely more than just a good human being with some good ideas. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is Almighty God. So as God, Jesus is sovereign over all things. And all things includes, it especially includes, the church. And that's what we see in the first vision to John. After the dazzling description of Jesus in verses 14 and 15, which, by the way, should be read symbolically, we read this in verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars from his, 
From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. Then in verse 20, Jesus gives us an explanation of these symbols. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So Jesus informs us that the lampstands symbolize the seven churches that John is writing to. And remember where Jesus is standing when he first gives this vision to John. Verse 13, in the midst of the lampstand. Jesus isn't some safe distance away from the body of believers. He's not in a galaxy far, far away. No, he's right in the middle of the Christian church. He's not only over it as its head, but he's also in the midst of it through the presence of the Holy Spirit. But why is that significant? Well, that question leads us into our fourth and final primary question, why was Revelation written? Well, the short answer is that it was written to bless us. Look again at verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, of course, John is not talking here about some kind of material blessing. It's not as if we can read this as if it were some kind of good luck charm, where suddenly everything starts to go well for us. Remember that John was writing to Christian churches that were either already or about to start going through some pretty intense persecution. Their physical circumstances were almost certainly going to get worse, not better. And such a prospect probably invoked in them much fear. When John sees the vision of Jesus, he seems to embody that fear. Starting in verse 17, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death in Hades. Jesus tells John and the Christian church as a whole to fear not. Why? Not because the church will be spared from persecution and tribulation, but because Jesus is the living God who died for the sins of those who trust in him so they wouldn't have to suffer the second death of hell. That means that persecutors can kill our bodies, but they can't take our souls from us, and they certainly can't take away our salvation. Nothing can separate us from the love and care of Jesus. He is in our midst, And the only things that will befall us will be those things that he allows. Through his death and resurrection, he has mastered even death itself. Death has already lost its sting, and one day it will lose its existence. So John's main message to us in this first chapter of Revelation is, Be not afraid. Jesus has mastered all things, including sin and Satan and death through the cross. He has already struck the death blow. He has already won the decisive battle. And while Satan still thinks that he can do something terrible to God's people, he's nothing but a toothless dog whose days are numbered. He's all bark and no bite. So the book of Revelation was written not so that we would be afraid of the future, but so that we would take heart and have hope in the future. Revelation is a letter that's written to us here and now in 21st century Mesquite, Texas, so that we would be blessed with the knowledge that Jesus has already won the victory, and one day he will return to a victorious people. Before I close today, I just want to give you some practical tips in this series on Revelation. If you haven't already, try to read the entire book from start to finish. That way you know the overarching narrative. Don't worry about trying to decipher all the symbols or getting the chronology right. Just read it straight through. Then once you've done that, go back and reread each chapter more slowly. And if you can, try to read the chapter or chapters that I'll be covering in the next week's sermon beforehand. Next week, I'll be in chapter 2. 
This series is going to be a survey of Revelation that'll last about 15 weeks. So I'm not going to explain each individual verse. And there will be some weeks where we cover two or three chapters at one time. So it'll be good for you to know the overall content of those chapters. The last piece of advice I have is to try as much as possible to avoid needless speculation. Try not to engage in newspaper eschatology, in which you try to line up all the prophecies with certain current events. Such a thing usually leads to confusion and disappointment. Not to mention the fact that I don't think that's the intention of this book. If we simply keep our sights on Jesus during this sermon series, we won't lose our way. And if we allow it, we'll even be blessed by the Spirit of Jesus in our midst.